Hello, I'm Rodney Anonymous. I've produced thousands of albums, I've played with hundreds of bands, and I was once the roadie for none other than Haircut 100. These are tales from my brilliant career in music. Greetings, Gherkins. It's me, Rodney Anonymous. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you tonight or today or whenever you're watching this uh, takes place in the summer of 1987. Um, I was in my late teens, early 20s. I can't remember which, but I was pretty young and I was on the top of my game in the music world. And I may have mentioned this just in passing uh, in a previous video, but I had written the score for a little movie called Cutthroat Island. Yes. So, I mean... My phone was just ringing off the hook, you know, people offering me jobs. So one day, I pick up my phone, and this is guy, and he says, Hi, my name is Ridney, Ridley Scott, and I directed a movie called Alien. And I'm like, so what? So, you know, what do you want? You, you want a medal or a chest to pin it on? So we go back and forth for about 20 minutes, and we decide he'd like to have the medal. You know, makes sense. So we're not getting off to the best start, but I decided, you know, I'll keep talking to him. So he says, well, listen, I made this movie Alien, and I saw recently, and it really changed my view of, of filmmaking. Cut through Island. Uh, and I really like the score you did for it. So I would like you to write the score for the new movie that I'm working on. So I'm like, well, you know, that's, that's fine. Hey, look, as long as Bob Fosse is going to choreograph the dance numbers, I'm in. Okay, I am totally in. He's like, well no dance numbers in it. It's a science fiction movie. And I'm like, listen here, pal, Captain EO was a science fiction movie. And there were dance numbers in Captain EO. There were plenty of them, maybe too many of them. I don't know. I didn't really, didn't really stick around for the whole thing. So he says, no, no. Um, he goes, this, this movie here, this is, uh, um, this is totally, totally different. Okay. This is called Blade Runner. And I'm like, well, that's that's not really a winning title. That's not that's not bowling me over. He goes, well, it's based on a a story called "Do Androids Dream of Electronic Sheep?" And I'm like, yeah, you you stick stick with Blade Runner. So I'm like, well, tell me about this movie. You know, if I'm gonna do the score for it, you know, sell me on it. You know, give me the pitch. He goes, well, um, it's all about uh, uh, the main protagonist is Deckard, and I'm like, wait, the guy's a deckhand. Do they have deck hands in in space? He goes, no, no, no. His name is Deckard, and I'm like, what? Well, that, that's a stupid name. What you got to do is you got to use that winning formula from Star Wars, where your your science fiction character has like a midwestern first name and a science fiction last name. So I'm like, here's what you call him. You call him Kevin Spacey, huh? Good, huh? Huh? And you know, he's like, well, you know, I'll think about that, you know. So. He's like, look, I'll tell you what, I'll send you over a rough cut of the movie. You watch it and get some ideas for a score for it, and we'll talk again. So he arranges for me to go to a, a small theater downtown here in Philly uh, and see a rough cut of, of this Blade Runner movie. And then he calls me up a couple days later, and, and he asks me for my thoughts. And I'm like, I got questions. <laughs> I, got, I got a lot of questions. I'm like, first of all, how many replicants are there? Because there's a scene in a cop's office where the cop tells him, tells this, this deckhand character, uh, Luke Spacey or whatever, uh, Luke Spacewalker, uh, Deckard Spacewalker, whatever you want to call him. He says, look, six replicants escaped. OK, that, that's six replicants escaped. All right. Now, um, so one of them got fried on a fence. So in, in my book, that leaves five replicants. There, and, and if that's not correct math, then, then the college I went to uh, owes me a refund. And he's like, well, here's the thing. I want people to kind of wonder whether or not Deckard is a replicant. And I'm like, that's – no. I mean, his name is Deckard. How many people do you know named Deckard? Of course he's a replicant. Look, at, look how wooden the acting is. You know, I've seen I've seen better acting out of well, those woolen sock monkeys. So he's like, well, you know, we're still we're still playing around with that idea. We may change it back to five. I'm like, OK. All right. Well, then I got another question for you. All right. Why do you got to have the replicants look exactly like people so they can get loose and blend in? Right. Why not just like 
weld a Viking helmet to everybody's head. You know, that would cut down on the number of people that you would think were... Or like an LED that flashes, uh, that flashes you know, replicant on it, you know. I mean, nobody mista- mistook CP3O for a human being. So, you know, he's like, well, you know, he starts throwing me, well, you know, it, it, you know, it, it makes the plot work better. And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then I say, you know, th- I start thinking about it some more, and I thought, there's a lot of problems you're not thinking of here. There's a lot of people are going to get smoked for when somebody says, oh, it's a replicant, boom. Because if the cops could just say, oh, he was a replicant, they'd be, you know, popping people left and right. And I'm like, this movie of yours takes place in, again, we're talking, we were, him and I were working on this thing uh, in, in 19, uh, um, in 1987. And I'm like, this movie takes place in, in the year 2019. I get the feeling the band Kraftwerk will probably still be around. So are they going to get mistaken for replicants? Is somebody going to go in and start unloading on Kraftwerk? What about somebody doing the robot? You know, ooh, you drive me crazy when you do the robot. They going to get smoked? And he doesn't have the answers for me. And I think I'm frustrating him. And then, like, also, they got this four-year lifespan, this built-in four-year lifespan. If somebody sold you a toaster and said, oh, yeah, by the way, in four years it's going to die, you wouldn't buy the toaster, let alone some sort of human being. So he's he's you know, he's like, look, um, you know, this is and this this is this is all outside of your purview as the guy who is writing the score. I'm like, no, no, I think there's improvements you can make. OK, first of all, that tears in the rain speech has to go. That that's dumb. But leave the part where that cop says. Talk about beauty and the beast. She's both. That that is a that's a great line. So he's like, look, look, just the music. All right. Just focus on the music. Do you have any thoughts about what you would like to do for the music? So I'm like, well, that's easy. String bands. I want to have a string band sound, you know, going through this thing. And he's like, well, what's a string band? I'm like, wait, string band. I go, wait, it's the thing we have in Philadelphia, the mummers. He's like, well, what are the mummers? I'm like, the mummers are basically guys in drag, but if you say they're guys in drag, they beat you to death with a claw hammer. So he's like, well, that sounds intriguing. Can I I hear what that music sounds like? So yeah, I'll send you over some of that. So I fax him over uh, a mummers album. We had to fax everything back in the day. When I got my first two Grammys, they were faxed to me. I mean, so I fax over the, the Mummers album. Uh, he calls me back like a day later and says, no, nah, this is, this is not, uh, not what I'm thinking about. Not at all. I'm thinking about, like, you compose something on a synthesizer, you know, that would sound very futuristic. And I'm like, look, buddy, the great thing about string band music is a lot of this stuff is in the public domain. You know, like golden slippers, you know. I'm like, it's, it's, we won't really have to pay for the rights for the song, for the songwriting. You know, so you and I can split that money. We don't have to pay me. That's more money left over for us to split. And he's like, no, no, no. No, I want you to write something on a synthesizer, the biggest synthesizer I can get my hands on. So, like, two days later, uh, this thing called a Yamaha CS80 arrives. And I mean, it's gigantic. And, and you know, I, I live in a row house in South Philadelphia. I can't get the damn thing in the door. Uh, so we got to leave it outside. It takes up two parking spaces. Neighbors are yelling at me all the time, you know, uh, and, and it snows while it's out there. So now I got to I know it's in the summertime, but we get weird weather in Philadelphia. So it snows a little bit, like, you know, and, and you know, you, you got to shovel your own parking space. So, uh, you know, kids are playing on it. Building, so I, I got to work fast on this thing, you know, before the weather changes again. Who knows what could happen? Sleet. Hail. So. Um, so what happens is I, I rush, you know, I, I get really motivated. I write a score. I send him the score now. What you're about to see is a little snippet of Blade Runner with my original score in it. I can only show you a little bit of it for legal reasons, but I think it'll give you an idea. Uh, Here it is. Okay, right now you're probably thinking, well, mistakes were obviously made, but you're not, you're only... That's like 10 seconds of it. You're not getting the full majesty of my score. It was beautiful. It brought people to tears. So, you know, really Scott, like, you know, he takes the score and, uh, you know, the movie comes out and it bombs. It goes right into the toilet. Uh, you know, critics are saying, are there six replicants? Are there five? You know, that sort of thing. Why do they look like they're asking the same question that uh, I'm asking. The only thing the critics liked from it was that, uh, you know, talk about beauty and the beast. She's both that line. So. Um, Ridley Scott calls me. He's freaking out. He's like, my movie stinks and people hate it. And I say, listen, buddy, I got two words for you. 
director's cut. Yeah. And he's like, well, what's that? And I'm like, well, that's where the director takes a film that, that bombed, and he says, you know, well, I'm going to recut it and put out a different version of it. It's going to be very popular one day in the future. Trust me on this. So he's like, well, I'll do Look, look, all right, you, you already had your, your shot at that. All right. You, you've already failed. So what we're going to do is we're going to call a buddy of mine, a guy by the name of Rennie Harlan. OK, he directed. That's right. Cut Throat Island. So we give the film over to Rennie. Rennie recuts, re- redoes the whole thing, um, re-releases it as a director cut. Only you know he got Rennie's name on it um, because he, I think, I think he was busy working on Nightmare on Elm Street four at that time. I'm not sure. Anyway, so we re-release it, the the, the Rennie Harlan version. Now here's the thing. So that's what you see now. You see director's cut. That's what that really means. It's another director. But um, because Rennie had worked with me on Cut Throat Island. He didn't want to repeat himself, so he brought in someone else to do the score for Blade Runner. So, like, one day I go out, and, and the CS-80 is gone. I thought the city towed it, because they put a boot on it. They slapped the boot on it, and they had all these tickets slapped on it, and they uh, meter maids were getting on my shit, like, man, you got to move that thing. So, it was gone, but it turns out that, uh, that, that, that it was pulled off to go work on the, the score for this movie. The other guy was doing it, and the other guy's name was, was Vangelis. So I like to say, you know, Van jealous of all my talent. So that that is the true story of the uh, how the score for Blade Runner got made, and and now you know. And I hope you you take that knowledge and you walk boldly into the future year of 2019 with it.